the world now has approximately like anything between 70 80 and 20 million people who are food deprived right which basically means that they're not getting two healthy meals a day so that's one out of every 10 people the flip side is that a third of the food which we produce gets wasted and thrown away. So there are like literally folks in the Robner army who over the last two years have done a food drive every single night of the year because they believe like they have extremely high levels of ownership. Like food is through weddings. 10 million weddings a year. No one wants someone to come in their f- wedding and not have enough food. Yeah. So everyone over indexes on the amount of supply of food they have. So there's almost waste wastage in every single wedding. There was one wedding in Surat where we actually served food to 9,000 people. 9,000? This is extra food from that wedding which wasn't eaten. Wow. And I'll be upfront here and transparent. Like, uh, a lot of these people are sometimes happier than people you see in other parts of your life where you work with or in your family or whatever. And you would think that oh, if someone doesn't have their meals, that, that just means they're very miserable, unhappy people. That's not the case. And so that's also like, just seeing that is very inspiring. Yeah. Happiness and success have very little correlation. Welcome to the Indian Silicon Valley Podcast. I'm your host, Jibraj. And today I have with me a very special guest. Join me in welcoming Neil Ghosh. He's the founder and one of the co-founders of Robin Hood Army and the chief custodian there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Neil, for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jibraj. It's so good to talk to someone who's from the same school. Yes, yes. Yeah. I was so delighted that we ran into you at the airport, yeah. uh, which sparked a conversation. Yeah. And since then, we've been in touch. Absolutely. You've been super kind and gracious with your time. Right. Uh, and I've been very, very inspired uh, with the purpose uh, with which you are building Robin Hood Army alongside this army, literally army of people. As as have I. Like, yeah. like, I don't know how many people in the podcast know how old you are, <laughs> but like just the traction you've generated and like the amount of like the number of investments you make and the noise you're creating in the space, it's very inspiring for a lot of people who are younger and older than you. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Uh, thank you so much. It means a lot when folks like you support. Um, and I'm so glad to be able to, you know, have you on the show because your learnings are immaculate. Every time I've spoken to you, I've just loved what you've been doing. Uh, I've, of course, observed from afar, heard about RHA. Unfortunately, I've never been a part of a drive, but that's going to change. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's amazing. And I want to understand all about how you've built mm-hmm. um, RHA. Right. Uh, before we go into deeper nuances sure. and understand the entire engine of what makes it happen, mm-hmm. I want to understand the core problem um, that you're trying to solve for. Right. While it's very evident and we understand that in broad numbers, hunger is an issue. Uh, I think uh, most of us who have the privilege of having a smartphone on which this will be aired, right. we may not relate to it on a first-hand basis. Right. A- and I'd love for you to share all insights on what this problem of hunger is right. that Robin Hood Army at its core tackles. Right. And then we'll go into deeper. No, no, aspects. absolutely. Uh, so I'd start with a caveat that I've we started with trying to solve hunger, but we realized that there's a lot more we can do while we're at it. Uh, and hunger is a massive enough problem for anyone to solve. We need like, not just us, but like the community to come together and make a difference. But in terms of numbers, the world now has approximately like anything between 7, 80 and 8, 20 million people who are food deprived, right? Which basically means that they're not getting two healthy meals a day. So that's one out of every 10 people. Uh, the flip side is that a third of the food which we produce gets wasted and thrown away, mm-hmm. right? And so that's the very obvious part, you know, like like one, both these problems can come together to kind of like feed and serve into one another. But I think what we realize while building this is that like, you know, like when we read and you were talking about like scrolling, reading the news, etc. We hear a lot about like, Problems which you and me can face, right? Like terrorism or corruption or pollution. But no matter how bad life gets, I don't think you or I will ever have a hunger problem. Yeah. So it's not very relatable. Exactly. And which is why it's not very captured, you know, the scale of the problem. Because it's not like when someone's reading it, they're like, I don't know anyone who's like that. Exactly. Uh, But that's one of the things which we're also trying to like, while we grow our community of Robins across the world, while we try to like, reach more and more people and try to like help them in any capacity it just spread awareness as to like like look this is a really really large problem even today in 2024 and yes the government is doing all they can yes there are a lot of non-profits there are volunteer organizations like ours but I feel it's the kind of thing which is kind of a collective responsibility for everyone to figure out how they can make a difference meaningfully 
No, absolutely. I think, um, uh, as you mentioned, right? Yeah. I think when you have food on the table, yeah, it barely bothers you to right. question who is not getting it right. because it's so readily right. available, almost at the click of a button. Right. Now. Um, but it's commendable how you started and where you are. Right. Um, for those who may not be aware, of course, uh, uh, I'd love for you to also talk about the massive scale and the organizational construct that you have. Right. Um, very few people will not be aware. Uh, but if you can just talk about, you know, the 140 me- million meals, right. 14 crore million meal, uh, right. 14 crore meals that you have distributed. Right. Um, uh, the three, the 270,000, if I'm not wrong. Robins, a little more yes. yeah, yeah, right. uh, yeah, that have been working collectively towards this initiative. Right. What do you come and together do? This has now been ten years mm-hmm. uh, to date. Right. Uh, would love to get a precursor to all that Robin Hunami does, and then we'll go deeper into some of those. Right. Bits. I'll do that. And uh, again, one caveat, and I know you warned me of not being too nice <laughs> before this, but I genuinely really mean it. That like, uh, I am a representative of like what the Robin Hood Army is doing at scale, 90% of what happens is things which I don't have an idea about. And I feel really proud about that. But when I talk about our numbers, our scale, the things we're doing, it's kind of like what the team is doing and not what me or my co-founders are doing really. Um, So in terms of numbers, where we are at right now, we have 280,000 odd Robins who registered. Now what we realize like on the field is that one out of two people register. Okay. So over the last like five or over the last ten years, we probably had half a million robins. Who are these people? People like you and me, you know, like young professionals, doctors, lawyers, students, retired citizens, homemakers who are doing this in their free time. Uh, we've served one hundred and forty-two million meals to date, um, and we've launched our operations across four hundred and three cities. Uh, we've launched in thirteen countries, but we are primarily active and growing in five to six of them mainly around uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, Again, the level of the hunger problem is much, much greater. So even if you're serving one and a half to two million meals every month, Mm -hmm. that's still barely scratching the surface of the countries where we serve in. Um, And so like that's that's something which is always on our mind. And like while we're, uh, while we keep acknowledging like the work which has been done by the people on the ground, we just realize there's so much more to do. Yeah, no, that's that's incredible. As I as I mentioned, to build a collective of force and passion that yeah. drives so many people is just uh, very very incredible. And uh, I I think I must tell the audience this that you will always hear Neil talk in like you know very collective pronouns, and this will never be an individualistic conversation, uh, which shows. I think in person also without the camera on, he's always like this and attributes everything to the team, which is very true. Uh, to the entire set of Robins. I no, think you need to know. And to that point, like, I'd love to call, I'd, I'd like to think of myself as humble. Yeah. And it's a value which I care about, but it's not about being that. Uh, what I've realized in the Robin Hood Army is like the very, very high levels of ownership. Hmm. So every single Robin, whether they're a 17 year old person who's just about to go to college or an 85 year old who's like serving in their local community. They think of it as their own baby, yeah. right? And in a weird way, I take a lot of pride in that, yeah. right? Like I, I feel maybe five years back, mm-hmm. if I was to kind of like not be around at the Robin Army, I don't know where it would have gone. Now I have no such insecurity. I feel like it's going to keep growing and lasting because we build the systems. Yeah. So that's why I feel like, like, yes, there's a lot of we in what we say, but it's also because of these very high levels of ownership and these people who are truly, truly selfless. Yeah, and like help in their own way. So yeah, it shows. I think uh, I mean the higher purpose of being able to replicate so many people like you mm-hmm. and in thousands and in lakhs yeah. um, is the bigger purpose, and yeah, yeah, it shows absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, no, but it's lovely. I, I'd be curious to know what is it fundamentally that drives people to help. Yeah, uh, I know a lot of people you know will observe this yeah. and they will hear about the problem. Yeah, but to incite this action, right? Right, uh, is reasonably there's this friction to it. Right, but, uh, some people have done this at scale now. Right, um, if you can talk to us about what do you think makes people sign up right. and then go ahead and deliver, right, uh, and then the feeling of joy that uh, is at the end of the service uh, that you end up providing. Right, what is it like? So, uh, I generally feel that every human being. At some capacity, they want to help. Absolutely. Right? And, well, and help is in many ways. It can happen in like 
companies, it can happen in religious communities, it can happen in schools, and it can happen in like non-profits or with with like people who are not so fortunate. So everyone has that inbuilt in them. Uh, what we do through the Robin through the Robin Army is we make it very visible for a regular person as to like how you can you can help folks who live not too far away from you with just a couple of hours a week. So we have a really really great social media team who kind of keeps um, sharing visuals, not of charity. We don't think of ourselves as charity, but more of like when let's say I am having a meal with you, Jivraj. I will try to get to know you. I try to get to know what drives you, what makes you happy, etc. So even when we're giving food to the less fortunate, they could be homeless people, orphanages. The idea is, it's not a logistics platform. Don't just give the food. Yeah. Spend time with them, share the meal with them, make them laugh and get to know them. Uh, so I feel that's something which is really well captured on social media, where we don't talk about like, oh, these are people who are not happy or they're helpless. We're like, this is just community building of a different cause. So a lot of people they get that kind of like strikes a chord with them that. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is this looks meaningful. It looks like it's worth a few hours of my time. I think when people come on the ground for the drive, we don't have to do anything. Mm. Like there, the work is fulfilling enough. Yeah, right. And one is obviously like I I generally say all of us do do this in the Robin Army for ourselves. Yeah. Like every time I go for a food drive, uh, and let's say I play cricket for the kids or um teaching folks like something like some math or something along with the food we're giving i forget about the other things which are worrying me in life yeah. maybe it's some report i've not submitted or maybe it's some tough conversation i have to have at work or maybe it's something personal which i'm not i just switch off and it's almost like that act of like being with another person and trying to help them in whatever capacity is very meditative yeah. you know and i feel each one of the robins feel that while doing it and that's one of the reasons why they keep sticking and they keep doing it themselves i think the third thing is people take a lot of pride in the fact that there's no money involved yeah. right so um it's been 9 10 years we don't have any permanent staff we don't have officers we don't have uh any inventory of vehicles uh but it's we still managed to scale it to a certain extent but in a weird way the most important building block of this is the robin yeah. right and they put their heart and soul into it because no one's making a buck yeah. they think of it as their own baby yeah. so i think that's the third thing where they completely trust the integrity of the organization the intent of like the wider community and that's something which kind of like really speaks to uh the tens of thousands of robins who are out helping people that's lovely i think um, it just speaks to the core motivations of people i think as you mentioned right yeah. everybody wants to help they 100%. just need an avenue 100% uh, that makes it simplified yeah. to make it happen yeah, yeah, yeah. and this is a great yeah. cause in yeah. and of itself um awesome i think this has been a great start uh, i'd love to go deeper into you Absolutely. know uh, the yeah. aspects of how you've gone ahead right. and built the robin and army uh, one of the things to start off there is of course the genesis uh, the very famous story that you've documented well is you know you were in portugal mm-hmm. for the project with zomato where you were expanding in yeah. portugal yeah. and you came across the organization yeah. eFood for context if you can you know uh, spark can take us down memory lane talk yeah, to us yeah. about what happened Um, and also i think for me the most fascinating thing was uh, i i'm sure people would have come across that organization before i'm sure people must have realized there's something to do uh, but to be able to take proactive action yeah. work on it continuously and then build and follow through on it uh, is what you have been done what you have been able yeah. to do commendably well yeah. um, i'd love to hear how that how, how you sort of followed through right. on the observation on the fact that this should be done right over to you so i think uh, if i zoom back maybe a few months or a year before the robin hood army started sure. uh i used so i joined zomato at an early stage and uh, it's quite right place right time and my fundamental uh, responsibility at that time was setting up our international markets okay and we were a bunch of 20 something trying to figure that out mm-hmm. and every day was an experiment and every day we made a lot of mistakes but i think the good thing which we did was we and this was kind of like brought in from dipender and pankaj is that like really reflect on your mistakes and make a playbook as to like what not to do mm. so i feel slowly slowly we started kind of figuring out like when we launch something new like what are the different building blocks of like launching so that muscle was slowly built into my head just through trial and error mm. now 
again as i said early 20s my only priorities were building my career and having a good time mm-hmm. right uh had done nothing really altruistic till then but this was uh, i think april of 2014 when we f- first like got the idea uh zomato at that point like their number one priority was becoming a global food discovery platform mm-hmm. so at that point our num our core and i still say our it's been like years since i've left uh but the core focus was becoming like the yelp across the world you know and yelp was like the market uh the market leader in the us but when we were going into different countries we were still relatively bootstrapped like far away from ipo far away from like large rounds of funding so the way we um spread the word in a new country was was to bartering was through barters with credible organizations okay. right uh folks which like the community in that country knew or trusted sure. and we would do things like placement on our website or offline events or like different kind of like talk shows with them just to kind of ease into the community sure. so through this i came across this organization called uh, refood which is still very respected in uh, portugal and spain and uh, what they did was really simple they collected surplus food from restaurants and gave it uh distributed to the less fortunate through volunteers now as i said not done anything altruistic till then but more than the altruism of it i just like loved how simple it was i'm like this is obvious i'm like this is not rocket science it kind of needs should happen everywhere so i try to spend more time understanding or uh, like how they work who are their volunteers how do they convince restaurants so spend some time with the founder he's a gentleman uh called hunter he's an american guy who went backpacking across europe and then he just just decided to stay in portugal for a few weeks and then he ended up being there for the last two decades wow. so fascinating guy just try to understand like what motivates him what motivates uh his team what are the operating structures how do they keep it sustainable over the years and then when i came back to india i got in touch with a couple of like close friends um from zomato and other parts of my life and we decided to start it as a weekend project so that was it was literally like very serendipitous it was not something i thought through like you know some people say i wanted to always do something when i was a kid i had no such intention it happened to me by accident but i feel very very lucky for the day we met the folks in Reefort because I found a purpose for like what has it been the next decade of my life yeah and that's amazing i think um, goes to show how far you can take inspiration yeah. and really replicate it for the country um i'd love to know that that these strong fundamental yeah. things that robin yeah. rami has mm-hmm. that is something you've spoken of in the past but things like no money exchange yeah. for anybody yeah. um this has been volunteer first always yeah. everybody who's part of the team also do they do things beyond robin yeah. hudami yeah. at their jobs yeah. and then this is what they do yeah. um during their other times um these are all foundational things which right. feel uh, like the pillars of robin hudami yeah. if you can talk us through some of them Absolutely. and the reasoning behind them and how it gets reinforced within the organization and to the outer world that would be lovely to hear No no absolutely. So I think initially the first principles were more moral mm-hmm. than strategic chart. And uh, we were like oh let's create an organization which is very high integrity mm-hmm. and uh so let's not have money so that there's no corruption which can seep seep through it. But I think over the years the most important thing is how many more people can we serve. Right? right? like it doesn't like that's the thing which matters it's not about us sure. it's about the people we are serving so what so the three fundamental principles we have and i'll probably unpack each one of them let's do that uh so the first one is that the robin hood army is a zero funds organization no one from within the organization can collect money in the name of rhj got it uh second one is we serve all religions uh and like if you're part of the robin hood army like we don't differentiate on the basis of religion when we're serving and three is uh, we all have our different political preferences and ideologies but we park it aside when we're coming and serving and uh, it's an apolitical organization so we'll have all kinds of partnerships but we're not 
going to have any political partnerships got it now kind of unpacking each one of them um the zero funds piece as i said was initially slightly trying to be a little holier than thou that oh we're not never not going to collect money but over time i realize it is a fundamental force multiplier right and what i mean by that is that right now there are as i said around 280000 registered robins each one of them they put their heart and soul into it because no one's making a buck for them it's their own baby so there are like literally folks in the robner army who over the last 2 years have done a food drive every single night of the year because they believe like they have extremely high levels of ownership Yeah. And they are the ones who are affecting the change on the ground, not me. We are building the systems. Yeah. So I feel as and when you mentioned like I'm the custodian, I'm like my role is to figure out more and more people yeah. who kind of come under the umbrella of doing good. So, and then we actually first this was a gut like we, we anecdotally like heard from people that this is what they love about. Was when we were this was around five or six years back we did a survey of around twenty five thousand robins, or ninety one percent of them. said that the the number one reason they dedicate the amount of time they do is because no one makes a buck or there's no money involved so you don't want to mess with that core motivation two is because there's no money we rely a lot on partnerships yeah. right and that's one of our fundamental leverage points in uh, reaching out and serving more people now partnerships are different types there are skilled partners like let's say the godrich group or uh, travel food services a company which gives food to like all airports across the country uh so they give us food like in the millions every year then there are restaurants who give us like food on an everyday basis other kinds of partners are partners who give us visibility mm. so folks like the abp group who's also a fellow is a very in mm. um so they give us like their free unsold inventory on television uh we've engaged and you would find this most familiar we've engaged the startup community a lot yeah so let's say um zerodha has built out this whole retention platform to track retention for the robins uber gives us rides uh, for our special projects at scale across the country uh yellow messenger in partnership with whatsapp uh have given us an onboarding channel where people can seamlessly sign up online uh clever tap gives us analytical tools now the pitch for each of this is that look we do this in our free time we like you like we are running our families and jobs or businesses or whatever but this is our way of giving back to the community and country are you in yeah. right it takes a joke to say no to that yeah. so the second i raise a dollar i would lose leverage worth millions of dollars which i get in kind sure. right and that's one of the main reasons the robin hood army is kind of grown and the last part of zero funds is if you're going into a new city or a new country like let's say you're trying to setting up in um, uganda right in addis ababa or wherever um and so i don't have to do any due diligence to your financial history like what have you done over the decades what are your bank statements say for me for the first half an hour or whoever from the robin hood army is uh, working with you they'll just try to get you excited mm-hmm. thinking like this is the best possible use of your time outside of what you do and then we're trying to gauge that do you have a bias for action mm-hmm. or is your heart in the right place are you doing it because you really care and do you have strong local networks which will help us grow our base if those then it's a simple hour hour and a half conversation yeah. and then we can launch a new city so now we've that's why we kind of launched across 403 cities we can be much more nimble and faster if we don't have the bottleneck of funds so mm-hmm. those are three of the reasons it took me a while to kind of articulate it in my head also mm-hmm. but now it's very clear in my head that that's the reason why the robin hood army is growing yeah. and for context like let's say the first 5 years of the robin hood army we served 11 million meals in the last four the next four other we serve 11x of that which is 128 million meals so you don't want to mess with what's working right yeah. so zero funds is one of the main reasons for that uh i think the political part is obviously sensitive uh but it's something which everyone agrees with yeah. right uh 
what happens is like we live in a place which has obviously very strong identities which mm. get linked to like who they follow what they believe etc what we are saying in the robin hood army is that we're not solving for us yeah we're solving for someone on the street so someone in a village who doesn't get two square meals a day mm. so it doesn't matter what my ideology is in life correct right? right so and also what happens is like as it grows you know like a lot of small cities have like robin sometimes in the thousands so it almost becomes a bit of a vote bank like yeah. like for some people where they like oh like we have a community of yeah. people here we can go so we like look like whatever happens it doesn't matter if you're right left center whatever mm. if you care about people being hungry this is a great place for you to come and no one including me would be sharing our political ideology with the robin hood army so it's again kind of a guardrail mm-hmm. to kind of like help us prioritize and what we are focused on mm. uh and i think the last part which is like serving all religions is kind of the same thing again different religions have different beliefs yeah. and obviously most people feel a little more affinity to sometimes people from their religion but again i think the crowd truth is a hungry person is a hungry person yes. and that's why we like look like it's not like we're talking about a few hundred people we're talking about like millions of people So when we do that then there's no scope of differentiation. Yeah. Like who we find we just serve with respect of what religion they come from. So these are reflections which have come over the first 4 or 5 years of building. It's okay. a lot of like inputs which have come from robins on the ground. Yeah. Like when they see a bottleneck when they see something which can cause some kind of friction which is nothing to do with our service then they kind of like highlight it and then we try to create a norm around it. but it's largely very decentralized people can do what they want but they, these are three guardrails which help us kind of like proactively solve for a lot of issues which could come got it does it make sense any thoughts on that yeah, no i think very commendable yeah. because i think these principles are necessary especially to do what you're trying to do at yeah. scale yeah. there's so much trust this is something you've gone on record to say yeah. right that there's a lot of trust with robins uh, i mean beyond the food uh these are folks who are champions within their community yeah. and stand for you know yeah. giving back stand for trust mm-hmm. uh and they have a lot of influence over others yeah. um to have any of these overshadow the human impact of what yeah. you're trying to do yeah. uh, is injustice to yeah. the cause that you're trying yeah. to uh further and i think that's why it makes complete sense and in you know interesting way it kind of breaks down social boundaries yeah of where you come from who you are what your identity is outside of a drive right so i've seen like some really deep friendships develop in the robin hood army which would not have happened in any other platform of life like even if i take kagita for example uh i know a group of friends who started the robin hood army right in the beginning who became friends like one of them was like an industrialist from a marwari, marwari family one of them lived in uh like a part of calcutta which uh is is ext- extremely like congested and crowded and like like is a ro- lo- local shop owner one of them was probably like a young person just about to go to college but even after the robin hood army they started hanging out yeah right and sharing perspectives and i feel like that's what all of us need to a certain extent you Absolutely. know just like go beyond our micro worlds Correct. and like see a bit of what's happening in the rest of life i feel that's yeah, a great yeah. educator and it's no no absolutely and it's refreshing to have spaces where you don't hold on to artificial sort of identities yeah. or your like preconceived beliefs yeah. you have a fresh start this is yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. neutral ground for everyone yeah. uh, which i love as in i feel everyone has their own beliefs everyone is kind of in the center of their own lives yeah so for them it's real like for for you like let's say your startup world your the it's startup ecosystem real. is very real for me like let's say like the work i do in big tech or the my world in the robin hood army is very real but it's always good to acknowledge there like a hundred other realities exactly. right and sometimes yeah, yeah. sometimes Precisely. like people kind of like forget that yeah. you know in it's good to zoom out like once yeah. in a while yeah. i guess yeah. yeah no no precisely i think uh, yeah it's refreshing like if yeah. you have an avenue where you can start from scratch mm-hmm. which is what robin hood army becomes mm-hmm. i think that's really really interesting mm-hmm. um i'd be curious to know as you scale right yeah. these also feel things where cracks are possible easily yeah, right so many uh, yeah i mean because uh, i'm guessing quality control is only possible to an extent yeah. uh, eventually yeah. it's self control right? yeah, yeah. um how do you solve for that has there been occurrences uh, where you've had to regulate 
uh, how do you establish control over some of these things? Because it feels like while fundamental, these are also points which can break easily. Yeah. No. Uh, and I wish I could tell you I figured it out. But uh, that's work in progress. And the way I see it will always be work in progress. Uh, now, let's kind of break this out into two parts. Like, let's say the cultural bit of it and the food bit of it. Sure. Right? Now, what happens is when, when you bring together passionate people uh, who want to make a difference in a community together, everyone has their own pre-existing beliefs. So, there's bound to be conflict, right? And I generally believe conflict is good. You know, it brings out sometimes the best ideas or the best execution. But how do you keep that conflict healthy, right? And, and how do you do that at scale? Yeah. So, that's something which we put a lot of thought into. Uh, so earlier when, like, let's say a city would not, like, align on something or a direction, there a lot of cases where myself, Arushi, Sanchit, my co-founders, uh, we would actually, like, try to mediate, try to hear both sides, get into this whole, like, courtroom kind of mentality. And then we realized that, you know what, like, A, this is not scalable. Mm-hmm. And B, it's not, it's not what our core focus is. Our core focus is serving people. So then we kind of like came up with this culture statement, you know, which was like one part of our culture says citizens first, Robins last. So what I mean by that, like, is like, let's say, again, you and me are Robins. We are, let's say, in Trivandrum and the local radio station has called us for an interview. Mm. Now, if you and me are arguing about who should go give that interview, that's not a citizens first problem. Mm. So then we're going down the wrong path. We become, we're creating an organization of mediocrity. If you and me are, argue, are arguing about what is the quality of the food we're giving, what is our pitch to restaurants, or like what is the syllabus of the uh, children we're teaching in the Robin Hood Academy, yeah. that is something which is worth a debate for days. Yeah. Because that's formative. That helps the people we're serving. So I think having some of those you know, cultural statements where you don't get into judge mode, Hmm. But the culture kind of defines like what yeah. is the problem worth solving and what's not. That has proactively helped us to a certain extent. The second thing culturally also what we've realized is that the, n- the number of people we serve is directly correlated to the number of active hmm. Robins. Hmm. Not Robins of Register, not Robins of Serve months back, but today as of like say the last 60 days, how many Robins are active. Hmm. Now that is also somewhat dependent on the quality of local leaders. Yeah. So of a city who are kind of like looking after that. We call them representatives, not leaders. Hmm. Now, when you have 20, 25 cities, that you can somewhat control training of local leaders. When you have 300, it's yeah. completely serendipitous and you should not even bother trying. Yeah. So that's something which really like, like played with my mind, like, you know, culturally, like, how do we kind of solve for that? And that's something which like, like, let's say there's a problem statement we took to Zerodha and a sub team within them called Force United, which is free open source software. And they built out this whole retention platform by which individual Robins could see their journeys on, mm-hmm. on the platform. Every time they go for a drive, they take a selfie and they check in. And then they, if they do 10 check-ins, they become a, gla- a ninja. If they do 50 check-ins, they become a gladiator. And they see what's happening in different parts of the country real time. Wow. So that's kind of like old school gamification. But we're trying to de- reduce the dependence on leadership. Mm-hmm. So earlier, the thought process in my head was how do we reduce the de- dependence on like, let's say, local city ads. Now, what I'm obsessed with is how do we re- reduce the dependence on me and my co-founders, yeah. right? It's always been a very leadership-dependent organization. But how do we now build systems mm. for this to kind of be slightly future-proof? Sure. So those are things, as I said, like we're barely scratching the surface. Yeah. But it's something we're always thinking about. That how do we find really smart people mm. who are specialists, who can kind of build out stuff to solve, solve for these things. So that's culture and that's like, and I can talk about for the whole podcast because there's so many uh, challenges on a real-time basis. And uh, But from a food perspective, uh, the one thing which we, because there's no money, 
we're very clear about the fact that no open army team in any part of the world will have their own storage facilities right because that's not scalable so what the cab- what that basically means is that if we have no storage whatever food we collect we distribute it within the next 3 hours okay right so that's solves a lot for like freshness yeah second is like we have food coming from every part of the country mm. so like it could be all kinds of cuisine mm. like north indian south indian east indian whatever so we can't have standardized templates for on a national level mm. but we let each city define what they feel are the safest items to distribute at scale got it right and they define that and they 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 take very uh, a, a lot of like norms and are, are drafted to kind of follow that right like what's what's least what's most perishable like how do we kind of avoid that if something is looking sketch then like should we t- taste it ourselves uh even during the pandemic when like food supply dried out from restaurants then and obviously the hunger p- issue was at its peak that time mm. uh, especially with re- reverse migration so then we pivoted towards uh, dry rations yeah so that's something which you know it's not going to get like spoiled that early so that's also something which we are constantly trying to like keep creating new norms keep sharing best practices yeah. within the community and uh, do our best to figure out how we can serve a healthy meal and that's amazing i think again goes to show how to build a because as i was you know preparing for the conversation also i was just amazed at how do you uh, build such a scalable organization with so many people contributing um, and efficiently mm. right i think uh, this is a very complex challenge in and yeah, of yeah. itself um, and to understand more about it is very fascinating yeah, yeah. um just to be clear we are always dropping the ball right uh, course, like <laughs> we are always dropping the ball we always like are trying really ambitious things and figuring out like what's the best way to serve but i feel because we're trying ambitious things that's why we are where we are yeah. and it's almost become a part of our dna while we're building out the open army i can imagine i yeah. think i i'm i'm hoping and guessing that this is more wins than not which is what keeps it alive but i'm sure there is a scope of error which yeah, yeah. any organization yeah, yeah. will have so completely acknowledging mm-hmm. that as well um but no very commendable to still see this scale and the growth at which uh, as you mentioned right like first 5 years visa we next 5 years mm-hmm. 11x jump and mm-hmm. i'm sure this is a number which is only going to grow mm-hmm. so incredible to hear that um i'd love to hear from you neil on the different aspects that rha has now mm-hmm. so we can talk about the academy yeah. talk about the supply side i'd love yeah. to also hear you know when you go to let's say a restaurant or now weddings you spoken about different avenues that have opened up how they so yeah. come together on the team in and of itself you yeah. mentioned to me that you know there's a core team they all do different things they pick yeah, it yeah. up how does that work they're very yeah. very incredible people by themselves who have like a shared mission yeah. and then the drives in and of themselves what they entail right. so maybe let's tackle one after sure. each sure. um uh, i think the supply side is the is right. the interesting one right. um you mentioned that it's been surprisingly pleasant yeah, uh, yeah. as how, how agreeing they've been Absolutely. to provide additional food mm-hmm. talk to us about their diverse nature you understand right. like the restaurant on the yeah. obvious one to begin with right. but what are the different organizations how much of convincing is needed what is the pitch right. uh, how willing are they to contribute how much of their food do they yeah, yeah. contribute i'd love to hear the different area no, that absolutely. happens absolutely. there absolutely no it's, as i said it's been a very um, it's been a very encouraging journey like this part of our building the obnana we the supply uh initially when we started uh you know at that time when you're intellectualizing the problem you kind of like have like a hundred assumptions as to what will not work this yeah. was one of them mm-hmm. we were so happy to be proven wrong not by our convincing skills but sheer kindness and willing to help on the other side uh so when we started we started with surplus food from restaurants yeah. of clients of zomato because right. those are people we knew right uh and what we started doing was like when we started going into other restaurants who didn't know us they like how do we know where the food is going So we started taking a lot of photos mm-hmm. of the act of sharing a meal mm-hmm. of like young folks or folks on different parts of the Robin Army serving in their green t-shirts and like having moments while giving the meals. So that was actually a bit of a game changer. 
was when we went back to the restaurants with like you know this is what we do in our free time and there's no money involved or uh, what they a lot of them actually said that you know why don't we give you a freshly cooked meals which we give our staff which we never expected right so again like coming back to the pitch two parts like one is show what you do mm-hmm. and they keep saying show don't tell but like show the pictures get them on for the drives give them reports of what's happening with their food and uh, two is again the pitch was like look we do this in our free time Yeah. The second you say that people lean in and they're like okay there is something human about this right or i think and that's a, another really powerful part of the decentralized bit is that a lot of the best strategies a lot of the best supply sources are things which robins in like let's say surat or robins in raudkela have figured out mm. they shared it and then we shared across like the whole country that these things were yeah Like for example, like a huge source of, um, like food is through weddings, yeah. right? Like today, I believe there are ten million weddings a year in India, if I remember the stat right. The and unfortunately, uh, no one wants someone to come in their f- wedding and not have enough food. Yeah. So everyone so, over-indexes on the amount of supply of food they have. So there's almost waste wastage in every single wedding. There was one wedding in Surat where we actually served food to nine thousand people. Nine thousand. This is extra food from that wedding which wasn't eaten. Wow. We in in the food, so that became a staple source. Uh, in cities like Hyderabad and Pune, uh, this was the twenty sixteen twenty seventeen when they've kind of like they're making slow traction with the restaurants. They decide to diversify it out to housing societies. So the Robins used to live in like housing societies of hundreds of flats. Each flat would make one meal or two meals for the Robin and Army, and on their local WhatsApp groups, they would they would coordinate what that meal would be. So that was again a very like simple and scalable way of kind of serving people who are in your immediate neighborhood or living in the streets, etc. And then eventually in COVID, uh, like when the first wave happened and there was lockdown and. or uh, people were walking back to their villages and that was probably hunger at its worst in this country uh we pivoted towards dry rations mm. and that's why like we've had these scaled partners like i mentioned travel food services mentioned godrich mentioned the wipro foundation um uh, there's a there's a company called snowman which is into cold storage so these folks these are listed companies and they've given us meals in the millions right and that's when we realized that you know what this is not necessarily need to be a city based model or a town based hyper local model this can also go to like remote parts of the country if we sort out our logistics yeah right so i think supply wise again like putting it together there's restaurants there's local communities there's weddings there's dry rations from companies and there've also been supermarkets mm. right so the spencers of the world the big bazaars of the world we've done ad hoc campaigns with them we're also trying to figure out like is there a legislative place play around this sure. by which we can make it mandated for people who are kind of wasting their extra rations or grains to to kind of be distributed to people who need it most got it yeah. got it very very interesting again multiple different sources yeah. you clear the motivations of each of them right. uh, and it's amazing how you've been able to channelize all of this energy and uh, you mentioned this often which is access to food more than the food in and of itself because the food exists yeah, yeah. it's more about bridging the access yeah. which you've enabled very right. well um alongside the robins uh, i'd love to come to the drives now one yeah. of the core components of the drives yeah. is the fact that you need to have a conversation alongside uh, and it feels like an experience right yeah. it is not just about the act of giving somebody food uh, but it is about having yeah. a shared experience yeah. i would love to understand again what were early drives like yeah. uh, how do you codify some of this how mm. do you ensure the experience is beyond fulfilling which it seems like um and what are components that ensure that the drive fulfills the core objective but also goes beyond provides that sense of joy satisfaction yeah. to the robin yeah. and the person in front who's getting that meal yeah that's a great question and uh, always love uh, going back to early days and like how it started and i think like i s- still go to drives pretty often 
the basic ethos of what happens hasn't changed a lot you know and uh, i don't know if it's good or bad but it seems to be working for now but if you have to visualize a drive and how it works so most people so again zooming out one step the robin hood army is hyper local in nature yeah so what that means is like let's say a mumbai will be split up into let's say at this point 32 or 33 different neighborhoods so in a chamber the food will come from restaurants in chamber yeah. the volunteers will be residents of chamber and the less fortunate will be homeless people orphanages old age homes around chamber mm-hmm. so essentially you are serving your 2 or 3 km radius got it and like and the people around you now these folks what's called a chapter mm-hmm. the sub unit of a open army team uh they operate on whatsapp right so they have already defi- defined over the week like what dates or what days will they and what time will they be having drives okay now each person who's attending that drive suppose there five or 10 of them they are allocated one or two restaurants each depending on how much food supply is coming in and before the drive they have to go to each of these restaurants and bring the food together right so that's done before the drive even starts when all that food is brought together these robins they meet in a common place it could be someone's office it could be the parking lot of a mall it could be like someone's garden or someone's house or uh, very fluid with that and then it's kind of about putting the meals together into a uh, tangible units which can be served sure. right then what happens is like what they've done from earlier not not during the drive is they've already scouted the places where they want to go and give the food to so for example like in a place like delhi if you go to a place with let's say 500 people and you have food for 100 people it's a really bad idea yeah. right so you really need to know and map out mm-hmm. like where are folks who need the food the most mm-hmm. and like what are the numbers so so that is an exercise called scouting which has already been done okay so during that drive i think what one thing which happens is like the folks who come for the first time hmm. they kind of get a induction got it as to like how the robin army works they introduce themselves they kind of are told that this is happening in different parts of the world as we speak right now today and they kind of put in the forefront or on the front lines hmm. of that specific drive you know so okay. that they are kind of leading the front or running the show and that builds ownership at on day 1 mm. right uh and they also told that look within 4 weeks you will be leading a drive mm. so what happens is as soon as they told that you know that innate sense of responsibility kicks in yeah. and now they're not a mere observer yeah. they become a participant and they try to find i understand every part of the process yeah some people don't care but most people they're like oh wow like i'm getting responsibility at early stage let's see what we, what i can do and then comes the the best part of it which is actually serving the meals and there what happens is that we are very very clear that look this is not charity mm-hmm. right there is no we are privileged and someone else is priv- not privileged and we are trying to help them we are just sharing meals mm-hmm. it it starts and ends with that and while we are doing that the currency which matters is spreading smiles right and we're like that is the core of what we're doing uh there's no top down way of giving food just enjoy the experience spend time with the folks take selfies with like the grandmothers play with the kids but you just do whatever it takes to spread joy and smiles and for a lot of us those are the best two hours of our week right that's the part which i call the therapeutic part yeah. and uh, i think what happens also through that like not on day 1 not on day 2 but after months of doing that there's a lot of trust which develops on both sides mm. and through that we really get a picture of what these folks daily lives are and through our limited networks what how what what difference we can make if people have like struggles with like eyesight or certain healthcare issues or if people their kids are not going to school or if folks are like struggling with like maybe like a very aggressive male member in that cluster then we they start confiding in us and then we try to figure out how can we make a difference to that 
and there are a lot of like beautiful stories which come out of that and for me that's almost the real niche of the robin army it i i mentioned it's not solving global hunger right now it's how do you bring out the best of humanity using food as a medium right it's yeah. like that's our mission statement so so then the drives are done uh and what happens is we kind of like try to document a bit of it through pictures uh, we often get questions why do we need to like document or why do we the whole point is like 95% of people would have not been there that drive those pictures won't there mm. so because those are our marketing uh metrics that's the way we kind of like serve more people and what we try to do after a drive is make sure like get people together in a local coffee shop or just for chai on the road and just like get to know each other and reflect on how the drive went and what could be different the next time over mm. and that's also like a very meaningful way for people to get to know each other for people to really like like understand which parts of like what the experience they can improve sure and uh, also like probably like figure out plans in the coming week or in the coming month in terms of like sourcing more meals so that's kind of like in a nutshell how the drive experience works it's a very uh human experience it's a very it's not at all one of those perfect six sigma models but uh, there's a lot of right intent and uh, there's a lot of like learning and camaraderie yeah i can imagine i just think um, it just sounds very codified as well and sounds joyful it's yeah. an experience yeah. um and to ensure that you know there are checks and balances yeah. yet the north star of spending yeah. smiles is very yeah. evidently clear and 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 to your point of how do we scale this or like this like when we figure this out like by trial and error in delhi or in other cities uh the first thing we like did we actually wrote a doc if you know the things you need to know before doing a drive So every time like we launch into a new city like we share that doc with them like you know this is how a drive experience works now we've actually like upgraded to like a do it yourself kit a bunch of videos which have been open sourced yeah on our website which is like what is the robin army culture how do you give responsibility to the first five robins uh how do you leverage social media uh what are our non negotiables what actually happens in a drive so these are like in a slightly less wordy way people can kind of see it and then form their own versions of drives so that's kind of like some of the ways we scale okay. help grow it and we have a dedicated growth and expansion team who are folks who grown through the systems so they were earlier robins then chapter heads and city heads and now they spend their time mostly on zoom or hangouts convincing people from the smallest of towns or different countries as to like why they should do the robin hood army and then coaching them over the next few weeks mm-hmm. as to like how to kind of set it up in their respective parts of the world awesome i think no again very very admirable in terms of how um how such a amazing cause is scaling right because it's again it feels like one of those things which can work well in a silo but to do this well across the board uh, feels a challenge and uh, that's why this is a very fascinating conversation um i'd love to understand now you know the different things beyond the food yeah, right yeah. what started off as food yeah. um, in my opinion as well i think the biggest strength is the yeah. power to mobilize purpose almost yeah. right like yeah. there is now trust which is yeah. established there is now a group of people who are yeah. high intent very purposeful yeah. willing to put themselves yeah, yeah. out there to help people mm. um how do you mobilize them at scale further right. for different causes right. um you mentioned different instances right. um I, i i'll probably ask you to reiterate some of them yeah. but uh, how are the different things beyond food turning right. out to be and right. how do you think that can further be mobilized for great causes you mentioned you know a uh, cataract surgery yeah. at scale yeah. you mentioned education yeah. which is happening via the academy right. you have mentioned the fact that a lot of different things uh, are also parallelly taking place mm. um talk to us about what those are and how do you almost again bring a system to it uh, yeah. while i'm i'm sure uh, yeah. i for instance had a very random idea as well the first time we spoke for yeah. a very long conversation yeah, yeah. as well uh, but it's difficult to pursue all while it is important to pursue some mm-hmm. how do you figure that out so um i think what happens is like as i said like the biggest enabler of all this is trust Yeah. Right when you are serving someone week on week month on month and having conversations with them uh what you're building is trust. Yeah. 
and through that trust like the idea is how can you make a difference to people's lives in whatever capacity now there are things which we've done which are ad hoc there are there's a ports there's a category of things which we done which we now scale and we have systems around it and there are certain things which as part of this beyond food mission which are event oriented something happens and then how do we react to it sure right uh so let's talk about like let's say the scalable piece the first part uh now what happened this happened i think 2015 in uh, indore the robins there they started teaching the children of the families they serve in their free time on the roads you know like basic like english and math and like general knowledge and like helping them if they're in school or not and i i come from a family of academics uh i was the black sheep of that but i but i still have my views in terms of you know how we can distribute food through systems in our free time but how do we like like is education the even the right thing to be picking up mm. like in some cases i feel like you can cripple someone if you give them a little bit of education and then stop yeah so i was not very comfortable uh but my co-founder arushi she kind of like saw it in a different way and she's like look you are looking at the input of teaching so let's look at the outcomes of someone going to school mm. right so the simplest way of thinking about this is if you're in college and you want to do your mba and i am to go through these feeder uh career launchers and times and what not like yeah. to go on an iit or to go through quota so we are the quotas or the career launchers of children on the street to put them into school for the first time mm-hmm. into government schools right so now the robinet army is robinet academy mm-hmm. is structured in such a way where uh we have a dedicated curriculum for 2 months with the only goal of making sure the kids get upskilled to the extent that they get enrolled into schools and we also have workshops or conversations with the families as to why those kids should go to school right or also enable them enable them through the admin process like making sure they have aadhars etc now even there like we get surprised thought we hear like earlier we would think that if we tell folks in the roads that like look you have a better shot at having a job you have a better shot at having a better life if your kids go to school they would send them to school but we realized that wasn't a great pitch what's a great pitch is that they'll get a free midday meal if yeah. they go to school and that that convinces people much more yeah. so even learning that on the ground is something which happened with practice and with time and with the trust we built yeah. so now the robinhood uh, academy has scaled we just crossed 200 cities it's in 201 cities uh we have hundreds of academy clusters in each of these cities we teach little less than i think 8000 kids wow uh actually, actually yeah between 8 and 10000 kids out of which 5900 of them have gone to school for the first time wow so so that was something which people started doing in their free time we realized some best practices we figured out what is the problem we are solving and then we scaled it right there are still many many ad hoc really beautiful things which happen yeah. which we haven't scaled but they're really transformational right uh and they could be the simplest of things like folks on the roads who do not have complete mobility in their legs or uh, giving them access to wheelchairs or if a school has been damaged by a storm or something in telangana making sure we kind of like repair it and get it back functional or in the case like we talked about cataract surgery so quite a bit where convincing people that look it's a dis free surgery we take care of the pre care and post care work but like can make a difference to your life some of these people have actually started seeing for the first time right um uh, and i feel that's kind of like where it came you know like these incidents are so micro but they are the real thing yeah you know they are in my mind like what i need every day what the world needs every day so like like just like how do you just tap into pure human kindness using food as a medium yeah. and that's kind of like how the mission statement came together and the last part is 
what can we do which is event based mm-hmm. right so now i think what we kind of realize is that like we have these samaritans in every neighborhood in almost every major city in the country mm-hmm. who can be mobilized really fast so now it's i think it happened again organically but if there's some crisis we can mobilize people on the ground really fast yeah right so in covid one of the things one of the projects we took up was in the first lockdown which was not the delta lockdown the delta lockdown we focused much more on oxygen on hospital beds on medicines but the first lockdown was everyone just being stuck at home which we were just talking about it like a few hours back a lot of fast in mind it but there were a lot of many like thousands of people senior citizens who were living alone who didn't have basic access to critical medicines or food whether they are privileged or not yeah so we thought okay this is a problem statement and we have people on the ground to solve it so we started a project called senior patrol where um, we tied up with uber who gave us rides like who gave us like free if you someone used the promo code robin they could go and uh, help these people and we partnered with the abp group who kind of put it out to like millions of people that if you have a senior citizen or an aged relative who's living alone and needs access to critical medicines or food then like we are partnered with the opponent army and they can make it happen just fill up this google form so that was really really impactful we did that across 100 plus cities uh there were a lot of like very near death incidents which we could kind of like enable and like help there were some funny incidents also where like someone wanted a bottle of booze uh, from us and we're like no that doesn't fall under our charter but uh, but yes incidents like so events like that now the events is like let's say natural calamities mm-hmm. or uh, for that matter any disaster so when there were floods in assam and like thousands of people in and around silchar had lost their means of like houses their livelihood etc within two days we could mobilize our robins across every part of the country figure out what is the core need is it medicines is it blankets is it clothes is it uh dry rations and through our partners mobilize it to silchar to be distributed by our silchar robins who are in the hundreds to to the last mile so that is something which we've done with let's say floods during kerala floods in assam uh during the drought situation in latur in 2015 in maharashtra where we can mobilize people really really fast mm-hmm. when crisis hits right and that could be a natural crisis it could also be a man made crisis yeah like so if there is a riot we can mobilize people really fast to again like create safe houses for people who are from a community which is not feeling safe so that is something which again i feel like when these incidents have happened you know during delta or during like let's say uh the recent train accident in orissa robins have got to the ground very fast and been able to like help very very fast and that's something which is difficult to quantify in terms of exact numbers but i feel disaster management is going to become a core part of our dna in the years to come also got it wow i am i'm always blown by the level of impact that you know you all can create on our creating yeah. it is very very inspiring to just know that there is this you know group of people who are combined by one mission which is to help um who are trusted yeah. and they can just make all the impact uh, yeah. in different situations yeah. even ad hoc ones see i think everyone does it in their own capacity like for example like let's say someone in your joint family was not well and struggling to get a medicine we like there are 40 50 people who look out for it correct what happens is when tens of thousands of pe- people are doing it together there's a compounding effect exactly. and then we can take much larger problems yeah so every like what i'm trying to articulate is that everyone's doing it anyway yeah but when you have access to a wider group of people it compounds. like more magic can happen yeah yeah that's that's very well articulated yeah. i think um, i completely agree but uh, super to know this Uh, I think the last leg is, of course, uh, we've discussed about the Robins yeah. already. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the team that you know yeah, yeah. Uh, builds out a bunch of things that has been responsible to put this together. Uh, you were telling me very interesting stories of you know who these folks are. Um, if you want to share more around, okay, 
how does the team think about uh, building the entire infrastructure yeah. the architecture for this the yeah. scalable processes yeah. i think that'll be super helpful to understand Absolutely. to understand the minds and the folks who champion much of this yeah. and the action then gets yeah. done by the robins yeah. no again this is my favorite part i love talking about like the folks are doing they i see folks who don't take themselves very seriously but take their work very very seriously so it's a absolute pleasure over the last 10 years to get to know them and like now as friends beyond robins uh but like let's say if we have to think about team structures and how it works uh let's talk about it from a city level and from a macro level and sure. the robin army in a city level like when we launch in a city it's the model uber used to use back in the day to launch in a new city where one person looks after supply which in our case which is food in their case it's cars one person looks after community so in our case that's social media and making sure people have a good volunteer experience or volunteer management and one person actually looks after after like operations like what's happening in the drives itself sure as a team expands these folks they build teams around them to mm-hmm. kind of like grow it in a hyper local chapter based way right mm-hmm. but it's still the core teams are still very much the same volunteer management social media restaurant supply and drive experience right now when it comes to let's say the macro team uh i briefly talked about a growth and expansion team yeah. people who have grown through the systems and now they're convincing people in different parts of the world on how to set up robin and army chapters wherever they are so they spend probably 70 80% of the time on calls just doing that and it's uh, it's again like think of it as venture capital like you're taking 10 bets and one will work out but it's a patient game sure but that one is worth it yeah. uh, right uh then we have again a social media and partnerships team so social media team like clear like how do we put out our narrative or our story in a compelling and humble way which will kind of like bring like minded people to come on the top of the final so right now we have around almost 100,000 people who sign up more than 100,000 people who sign up every month every year so the social media team is like how do we keep sharing what we do uh and they have enough obviously like quality content because of the drives which happen on the ground the partnerships team is again simple like who are the people we should partner with who can either get us more food or more visibility like let's say billboards or radio uh inventory or let's say lock screens and glance uh in- interesting things like that and lastly there's a team which can the partnerships also we get talent mm-hmm. so folks who kind of like build like simple tech solutions for us or folks who are building out like uh like let's say one specific project like in independence day where we want to serve millions of people who are partnering with that so the partnership team looks after that then there's a tech and data team so the tech and data team does what any other large organization would do mm-hmm. which is kind of look at funnels yeah. like where are people falling off how do we make the drive experience better like what are the compelling points to like go to restaurants and scale food or what can we how do we open source data and dashboards to anyone on the ground so that they can focus on on um uh, just the act of serving So the bunch of people from like my earlier workplaces from Google from HVS from um Zomato who are actually building out these things in their free time and uh, what am i missing as we talked about social media partnerships tech and data growth and expansion and yeah the core teams so like because like we need dedicated like team structures to run like 300 or cities So there are also the cities we've kind of like split up into global cities mm. which are like cities across the world million plus cities which are cities which have served more than a million people mm-hmm. and all the other indian cities right okay. and there also there's a tiered like team Approach. structure so there's like the india rep then there are zonal reps then there are growth reps and each growth rep looks out to 5 to 10 cities mm. right so there's kind of like a almost triangular pyramid structure there and uh, the million plus uh team that's very interesting because these are probably the 14 odd cities which have served more than 60% of our daily meals 
you know the hyderabads the bombays the karachis the delhis of the world now their idea of growth will be very different from the idea of growth of a different of a city yeah so like we look at them much more minutely we try to get them data driven at a much more deeper level uh their partnerships are also much more nuanced uh right now every time the like right now we're trying something called projects for this yeah. which is how does each city adopt five villages in their in the you know uh, radius of like 50 kilometers and gives them meals through the month like dry ration meals so it'll be piloted with a million plus cities so it's almost like think of it like centers of excellence yeah and if it works there then we'll scale it across the other parts of the urban economy so those are kind of broad level the structures and like everyone does everything you know in the sense like my co-founders like arushi runs a family business in automotive parts like which also employs thousands of people uh and she does the urban economy with that uh sanchit he runs his family business which is like like they have they distribute their distributors for a major fmcg brand and he runs his own tech startup along with building the urban economy uh there are really interesting folks like like right now gunjan who's the who was the cto of zomato for 10 years mm-hmm. uh he recently left now he's building out like a whole like tech play and like like refining our check in tool uh there's julia who used to look after um data in google pay and she's built out and open sourced all our dashboards uh for the urban economy so and i'm just mentioning again probably like less than 5% of the all these yeah. specialists who are kind of building it but really interesting people who just like have normal lives and uh, they're doing this with whatever they're doing you know like with yeah. like a few hours a week and purely out of initiative no other added incentive yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i feel there's a lot of joy. purpose yeah of course yeah the I, joy purpose is difficult yeah. to quantify yeah most people are doing it like i would argue they feel is the best part of their week or the best part of like they're using their brains their network their skills for something beyond themselves yeah. uh so as i said like i think all of us do it for us yeah. uh but but it's very it's very heartening to see so many people lean in i can imagine yeah. uh, how many people would this be roughly the the team perhaps so there's there's a team called the warum okay which are the functional heads of the macro teams right. right the one the four or five i mentioned that's probably around 12 odd people okay the india growth team which runs around 400 cities is approximately 40 people uh the and then over and above that there's your global team and there's some specialists who are not part of the warum so the people who are building the systems of decentralization are probably come to around 100 odd people cool. right and and this is only at a macro level every city will have their own data analyst yeah. have their own social media person will have their own uh like partnerships person so like we just kind of give the template to the cities and they do it themselves wow again very very amazed in a positive way impressed by the massive impact and the kind of collective energy that is being put into uh the entire uh, thanks initiative so lovely to know what do you what do you think are the chinks in this like what are your thoughts on things we should look out for in the years to come like what like what are the black swan incidents we should also prepare for in in a model like this yeah. no i think uh, the biggest thing to look out for will be how how to scale this to the extent yeah. i th- i think scale is the only challenge i feel mm-hmm. foundationally the models proven very well yeah. um i was curious to know why of the monetary exchange part because i felt that with more resources yeah. can this be yeah. more systematic mm. and also if absolute time would be helpful so when you mention that this is you know work alongside yeah. what you have on the primary yeah. aspect of living a livelihood yeah. it felt like uh, can there be more impact if there is singular retention by yeah. thousands of people on this um so that was the challenge in my head yeah, so yeah. perhaps that's the only thing yeah. but i think otherwise this works like magic and it looks like uh, it has all the guardrails to significantly impact so much of ground level people right. that we don't otherwise reach to right. because to build a human network at scale 
I think is the aspiration for so many people for the benefit of the country. So, sure. and it remains to be a unsolved sure. challenge sure. because of so many different like things around our diversity as a yeah. country. Yeah. But you've been able to do that, yeah. so I think. Uh, yeah. I think just making it commonplace, you know, like in a recent podcast, I think Kishor Bhani was talking about like the three Indias, yeah, like there's your hundred million consumer class, there's like three or four hundred million people or the people who work for the cons- consumer class, which is like the drivers and the peons and the helps and all of that, and there's a good nine hundred million people who earn less than like let's say thousand dollars a year, who we don't see. You know, okay. I co- I think of it as the the India we don't see, okay. right? And like they could be like labor in in agricultural setups, or people who are dependent on subsidies, or people who like in the homeless we serve in the Roman army. I just feel of those like hundred million people, they just have access to more of those folks. Automatically, there'll be like ma- many many such initiatives which are already happening, Correct. which will help bridge that gap and like take yeah. us forward as a country. Yeah, the triple effect needs to start yeah, someplace, yeah, I yeah. think. It starts with awareness. Yeah. I think most people have a kind heart. I think yeah. it starts with awareness. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Mm, this is very, very interesting. Very fascinated by the different nuances that yeah. are taking place. Uh, I think as we conclude, yeah. the, the final piece is, you know, uh, to understand the... We've discussed motivation, purpose. Mm-hmm. I'll have to understand how you personally sort of perceive... What can grow the mission beyond what you immediately do yep. to even further levers? Just what we yeah, discussed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and what is the motivation? You you mentioned respect in some podcasts. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, mentioned yeah. Uh, the purpose, yeah, but yeah. on a core level, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it that um, after a decade continues to drive yeah, you? Yeah. I would love to know. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Uh, I'm trying to think. What was the first part of the question? Uh, the first, the second part of the question was what's my core motivators. What was the first part of the question? Also, where it leads. I mean, where it leads? Yeah. Like, where are we taking this? Uh, so, I feel uh, for the first six, seven years, it was a very leadership dependent organization, right? Like, we had created dependent an organization of leaders in different parts of the country you're taking it ahead. Uh, I think that's risky. Right, because like if you even lose some of those leaders, then like any organization shaky object. So that's important, but it should not be critical. So I think on the last two three years, I've been obsessed with kind of like building a more systems dependent organization, Mm -hmm. right? Like where we have systems and teams which build the right brand, which build the right technology, which build the right flows, irrespective of whether there's quality, amazing leadership or not, which is not controllable. The service continues and keeps compounding, right? Now that will probably like in terms of like future three things we kind of want to double down on. Uh, one is, I feel like, and we have to also think ahead. Like, what country needed like maybe five years back will not be what the country needs five years later. I feel there's still a lot of tribal wells a lot of villages where there's still a lot of lack of access and will continue happening yeah. even as India keeps growing, right? Not because of lack of effort, but just because of the vastness of our country. Yeah. So I think right now, the one thing is what we're trying to do, we're calling it Projects for the Asia, is like how do we adopt initially hundreds of villages mm. uh, which have the lowest access to food supply and partner with the right organizations from a raw materials and logistics uh, lens Mm -hmm. and make sure they have meals through the year. You know, so that's... And ultimately, like, sitting in our cities and towns, how do we make food supply somewhat, as in universally accessible is not the correct thing to say, but that's the goal, or that's what we're working towards. So I think, like, uh, focusing on both urban and rural India is one big part. Second thing is uh, building this in different parts of the world where the need is the most. Like we've seen in places like Pakistan and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh that with the right leaders and the right systems, like it just compounds, right? Like, uh, so that's something which we're like identifying places in the world, like in Indonesia, like in Thailand, where uh, there are very high inequalities, where there is a population of people who are privileged and want to make a difference but don't know how. 
and there's access to a lot of like digital technologies for us to like scale so that's another part of like what we're focusing on and i think the third part would be the robin hood academy you know as i said like i'd love it to be in a position where 10 years later we're not serving 10x the number of meals but we're serving 110th the number of meals mm-hmm. just because there is no need of it yeah but then we still have that huge network of samaritans Correct. and then how do we kind of like mm-hmm. divert them towards what the community needs and that could be putting children to school making sure they stay into school and they don't drop out making sure that they get upskilled in uh in fundamental like skills or for that matter making sure they have the right mentors so developing the robin hood academy is going to be a critical foundation tool for that so you have to keep looking ahead and keep reexamining like what we're doing today is it relevant or not absolutely uh with respect to personal motivations uh I, and i'll be upfront here and transparent like uh, there is a altruistic bit and there is a me bit sure. and i like it's important to have that clarity for you to keep doing it your own your why are you doing what you're doing so i think since i was in school i've always like felt a inordinate amount of happiness helping people in any capacity right like whether it's friends teachers someone on the road whatever it's just uh it's a high uh and i don't think it's new i think most a lot of people feel that but i'm like doing this at a scale which can make a difference to like people in like hundreds of kilometers away who have no access to i don't know who they are but like help is happening because of something someone has done in the robin hood army uh i like it it's it's a huge motivator you know i feel like like it it really feels good like using your skills your network to kind of make a difference in helping and it gives me a lot of happiness and joy and i feel like it's 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 a core part of like if like this country has so much potential if everyone looks at our, out for each other a little more we'll just like meet that potential like a, in a faster way or uh, with respect to me i i realized like quite early in smarto when i used to work there rory says that i always thought i wanted to build a large organization and i always thought it would be something which uh makes a lot of money or has a lot of users but somewhere eventually within like 4 or 5 years of building the robin hood army i realized like you know this is the one yeah and it doesn't like pay the bills but it gives me all the highs all the intellectual stimulation all the uh imposter syndromes which come with like building something at a large scale so i feel like that is something which also personally drives me you know like and now it comes to a point where like the organization's way beyond me but what's really really important for me is that it continues yeah yeah and irrespective of who's leading it who's running it uh so that's been a that's been a personal motivator and i feel like i i'm not like i'm not like very enamored by a, like money beyond a certain extent like beyond being comfortable or fame beyond like like fame or something but what matters so what has mattered to me and i want to actually work on it is like also respect from peers seniors whoever and that's something which most robins get a lot of you know because yeah. they're just trying to do like help in their own capacity so that's also been a motivator and like while well, we kind of been ramping and building in this up awesome i yeah. love that i think um, it really encapsulates uh, what you're trying to do i i love the impact uh, aspect of you know doing this at scale yeah. and scaling the bit around the academy because right. that feels like yeah i think foundationally if you just uh, help educating yeah. um thousands of kids i yeah. think that will just transform their futures and hopefully yeah. um you know the food will not be a dependent mm-hmm. factor mm-hmm. and uh, your personal motivators to our uh, very encouraging i mm-hmm. think these are uh, things that we foundationally chase mm-hmm. as humans as yeah. well we want yeah. a purpose we want to build organizations especially in the startup mm-hmm. world we're all entrepreneurial and uh, we also crave a level of you know mm-hmm. respect uh, yeah. that we hope we can yeah, command yeah. in the room that's something i wish i with with in the next coming as i'm working on like it doesn't 
be a core need anymore because, shouldn't matter because it's because, external yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like yeah. It, like if you're happy with what you're doing that should be enough okay. right. yeah 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 but yeah. no but but uh, very well rounded and very exciting now uh, one thing that you know just came to my mind neil and it be fascinating to hear your answer is considering you just served like for like for 140 million uh, 14 crore meals have there been insights that make you realize what what is the emotion these people have yeah. who may not have meals yeah. yet are living their lives yeah. i mean yeah. what is the core thing that they believe in they feel what yeah, is it yeah. that drives them right so one very interesting thing uh, or reflection is that like a lot of these people are sometimes happier than people else. you see in other parts of your life where you work with or in your family or whatever and you would think that oh, if someone doesn't have their meals that that just means a very miserable and happy people that's not the case and so that's also like just seeing that is very inspiring yeah but i think it the core is obviously like what would be the core for any middle class person which is like how do we move life ahead mm. how do we kind of meet the responsibilities we have for our children how do we make sure they have better lives now that's just relative for everyone depending on which income strata they are in mm. like for someone going to a private school their obsession is how do they get into a great college yeah for someone who's uh on the streets like their obs- their obsession of like how to like meet the responsibilities of the kids how do i make sure my kids have like primary education till class 5 yeah or how do how do we make sure that like like food is something they don't need to worry about yeah right so the core is still the same mm. just the metrics are different okay right? yeah. like they like the more you spend time with people you just realize they're just like you yeah i agree i agree now the reason i ask is because especially as like capitalists who are yeah. looking at we don't have to worry about foundational survival yeah like our survival yeah, yeah. is taking care yeah, yeah. of what we worry about is of course how do yeah. we take our causes forward what we have thoughts on scale yeah. all of that but it's difficult to then envision uh, what the sort of general joe think yeah. about when survival is actually a question for yeah. them right yeah. so i think that was my curiosity yeah yeah no it's there but like it's obviously there it's a core thought in their need is something which build build in anxiety what's really inspiring is it's not the end of the world for them hmm. they still find a way yeah they'll find a way no it's in their mind at that point it's not the end of the world yeah okay and right. for me i've had issues in my life which are much less but i've always thought oh this is the end of the world what's yeah. there after this so that's very <laughs> like like it's educational <laughs> yeah. you know like so uh so there it's not there is a lot of like need to figure out their lives and need to figure out how to uh like solve for the next next month's meals mm-hmm. but a lot of people who are just like relatively like content people yeah to speak all they want is just the basics and that's awesome i think very encouraging to hear yeah. and i think very refreshing provides other side it's a two way street like Yeah, we give and we get yeah. in this whole process. I can imagine, yeah. but this has been lovely. I think we've covered yeah. the entire ambit of what it's meant to, you know, build, scale, mm-hmm. and collectively have yeah. this literal army yeah. of people. Who no, these are very, do good. very thoughtful questions. I had to like really go down rabbit holes of different parts of our journey. I'm so, so glad. Like, I'm so glad. Really but uh, as we conclude, I, I have a series of just uh, similar yeah. questions sure. that I ask most people, sure, sure. and these are the I'll probably. tune some of them to your personal journey as well yeah, which yeah. we've not gotten a chance to dive right. deeper into but as we conclude we'll probably take a stab at mm-hmm. it um the two questions there are pretty much standardized but the first one is what do you fear not not constantly learning okay not constantly learning interesting and uh, the second one there is if you could highlight one superpower that you have what would that be friendships yeah. lovely that's so a, i feel like that's the something i take a lot of pride in and uh, yeah amazing then mm-hmm. those are both very refreshing answers mm-hmm. um on the personal bit i think one of the things that 
you've had the pleasure of being a part of is the Zomato story, yeah, yeah. which is a very sort of, you know, um, recurrent and recognized story in the startup ecosystem. It's helped reinstore the belief in so many people that, you know, if Zomato can do this, yeah. so can us, yeah. uh, so can we. So um, if you had to share like core learnings from being a part of the journey early on yeah. um, to how you witnessed the success that we've all gotten to see from afar. Right. What would those learnings be from a startup lens, from a building lens? I think more than core learnings, I think a lot of it was like core mistakes, which I or some of our teams, we made at an early stage and we learned from that. Yeah. But um, I feel one is that the first and only thing matters, which matters is culture, mm. right? And uh, that builds very high levels of ownership. Mm. Right? And ownership very simply means treating something like your own. Yeah. Right? So like in 2014-15, if Dipinder told us that like, look, we want to become a global company, like I would feel more strongly about it than he would mm. in my mind. Yeah. because like I'm like yeah this, like, this is a part of us and this is our way of like taking a small Indian startup and making a global dent yeah. whether it happened or not is a different thing uh, but but I feel like having that ownership mentality or that founder mentality is something which uh, Zomato in cult case at a very early stage as I said earlier in this podcast like it's been years since I've left I still sometimes refer to it as we yeah uh, I think the second part is just a humility to know what you don't know mm. right and there have been multiple examples where uh, I remember like our founders at a very early stage they kind of um, like they would give me projects and I was in my early 20s and say that look your skill set is here what we're asking you to do is this with the trust that you'll bridge the gap but if you're not just ask for help at the right time so that made me very self aware that I'm not cut out or not done enough to do what I'm doing but that's but bad. but they're, they're taking a leap of faith, and I have like their back. So just knowing that makes makes every project a little more humble, a little more like just self aware, and then you try try your best to kind of make make it happen. And I feel like Zamato had this innate, relentless passion or aggression from a very early day, and I still see it today, where. It's not conf like they don't conform to what is conventional, mm -hmm. but like keep thinking about what next. Yeah, right, there's something which I learned in Zomato, which I take into the Roman army very much. So it's called one percent done, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. okay, like don't rest on your laurels. What's happened has happened. What's the next step? So I feel that's something which uh, it's like, and I have a bunch of friends who are still very much like part of the team and all of that. They still adopt the same mindset, and it's very very inspiring. Lovely, lovely. All of those C learnings, very, very core and very, very um, noteworthy. Thanks for sharing. Um, the other thing, which is more personal to my heart as well, is yeah. that you're a Calcutta kid. Yeah. Uh, that's, of course, you know, um, you've, you've grown up there, then you moved to Bombay, mm -hmm. you've been a sports fan. Mm -hmm. If you had to summarize life beyond, let's say, Google, RHA, Zomato, what would that be? I uh hope. -huh. I think it starts and ends with my friends and family. Uh, like I come from a really uh, small nuclear family, it's just like my parents and my sister. And uh, I'm married right now, and we have a three-year-old dog. My wife, uh, Cyber, she runs her own business, and something I'm very proud of. And like my sisters, the fourth generation academia, and they live in England. And then I have my so I've kept moving around. Like, I ran schooling in Calcutta and Bombay, college was in Delhi, my first job was in Hyderabad. Yeah. Zomato took me to like four to five countries, business school was in Boston, then came back to Delhi. So, in every journey, I've taken two or three friendships which have stayed with me and have always like been very core to who I am. And I think the, the absolute first love has been uh, cricket all my life. I think like, you know, our school had a very, very high standards of, of, of cricket. At a pretty young age, I realized like I don't have the talent to take it beyond a certain point. But even right now, like I'm, I'd probably say I'm one of the most passionate Indian cricket fans out there. Uh, you went for all matches, I've, all Indian. Yeah, I've gone for every yeah. World Cup 
semi final and final since 2011 oh wow so 11 15 19 like no matter what's there in my bank account i run there was a time where i don't really know if i should be saying this in a podcast but i spent like the last part of my business school loan <laughs> to for my final ticket in lords wow. <laughs> but uh where they am like since we couldn't make it to the team the least we can do is be next to them <laughs> yeah but which yeah, cricket is something which i i love that eat breathe and live awesome no i yeah. think that's that's good to know and um, yeah no i, I can I can add to it. I think you're one of the kindest people I've met just from the that's, get that, go. That's that really is, sweet. That, yeah. I, that also shows beyond yeah. the work persona, mm-hmm. and that's very very interesting. Uh, I have two final questions. One sure. is on your. Uh, we've not gotten a chance, but to those who may not be aware, you also work at Google, yeah. uh, and that's a significant part of your yeah, life yeah. professionally. Yeah. Um, I'd love to understand how it's been to go from Zomato. Yeah. You working at you know a big tech organization in India right. take responsibility right. work at scale perhaps. Right. Uh, how does that impact your mindset of yeah. um, you know forming the right. entrepreneur that you are right. uh, with R H A and with your right. other efforts? Right. No, it was obviously culturally very different mm-hmm. from what is used in Zomato. Like uh, what in Zomato, like decisions were made on the fly, and they were very very fast. Uh, in a large organization, obviously, it's more measured, more thought through. or uh, more layers which took me some time to get used to but the flip side of it and what i've learned is like there's a lot of focus on long term thinking mm. like what how does this pan out for the next 3 to 5 years what are all the variables which can pa- which can happen and what are the pros and cons of it and also also a lot of focus on leverage mm. so let's say the first product i worked in on google was google pay and uh, the whole team like even today like takes a lot of pride in kind of like building something which like now 200 million people use for their day to day payments but i could see at a very early stage even if i was not in those decision making rooms as to like how the product is thought through in terms of like really making it permeating even when they were like 20 or 30 million users they already had their sights on 300 million and a path to that mm. so that's been quite uh, educational and so, in a sense and uh, And right now, obviously, like there's like the whole Gen AI phase which is coming in, and Google's trying its best to kind of like uh, with Gemini, etc., to be a strong player in the game. So it's a very interesting time to kind of like be in the organization and learn things behind the scenes. Yeah, amazing, amazing, lovely to know that. Um, the last piece of the pie, which is of course evident, is also you went to a business school yeah. at Harvard. Yeah. That's of course one of the most sort of recognized and reckoned schools in yeah. the world yeah. and that's an aspiration for many people yeah. um how was your time at hbs uh-huh. uh what was it like and yeah. uh, what were core learnings from business school yeah. that you carry forward and practice in day to day yeah so my uh, priorities in business school were quite clear uh oh. since day 0 i in fact i had a if i zoom out a little i had a con- and i think I don't know if we talked about this when we first met. Like, so there's this uh, friend slash mentor I have, Tanmay, who's the founder of One MG, and we had a conversation. I think like, and he had gone to like the like Stanford, the GSB, like ten years before me, and then he had come back to India for Zomato. That's where we met. And I asked him like, you know, what are the who are the kind of people who are like happy in your class? Like, you know, like what are they doing? Are they successful entrepreneurs? Are they in big tech? Are they running like hedge funds? So he's a very data driven guy he kind of like started mapping out people and who does what and who's happy and who's not. But then he looked at it like for like 5 10 minutes and he's like you know what the only trend is that whoever was not happy in business school or whoever was happy in business school is still happy today whoever was not happy then is still not happy. Right? Irrespective of how well or not they've done. Yeah. And I found that quite powerful, right? Like so I was very clear that I need to be happy for these two years <laughs> because otherwise the rest of my life is screwed. Yeah. And and so so my focus was just honestly like building deep friendships and relationships and building the Robinhood army. And uh HBS was a big force multiplier uh for the Robinhood army. My accounting teacher she wrote a case on it which has now made us like much more relevant when we do partnerships etc. Uh learned a lot of like leverage uh, a lot of the countries we launched in were people who section mates who connected me to uh people from like friends they knew from their countries or ex hbs alums mm. a lot of our major partners today a lot, lot of them i mentioned today are alums from that school so it was a great leverage tool for like building out 
the Ropnad army. Takeaways or learnings, I think, uh, one very, not career or personal one is like, happiness and success have very little correlation. Right. Okay. I, can, you, can you expand? Yeah, I feel like I see some, I've seen some incredibly successful, smart people, but who were just not happy or at peace or at content and they want it to be. It's not like, it's a different thing if you just want to be successful and you don't want to be happy. Yeah. But uh, success can just like make things comfortable. You still have to work on your happiness and being a happy person. So I feel that was like something I expected everyone to be like really happy, really like smiling and all of that. But like uh, sometimes more success means more insecurity, which was uh, interesting like to, mm. to, to see and navigate and like sometimes maybe even feel myself. Yeah. Uh, and the second, the second thing which was quite compelling was that, you know, like HBS has also over the years, like sometimes not had always a stellar reputation of being, like it has a reputation of a very cutthroat capitalist place. So they're also like focusing on how to kind of like educate differently. So there's uh, a professor I had, Larry Kulp, uh, who's now the CEO of GE. So he used to teach us leadership. And... Uh, he said something which is very compelling, you know, it's like, like generally the way like work, things work is like you do well, you get successful, you make a certain amount of money and then you kind of look after other people. That's like the last phase. He's like, it's not like, are you good enough to like help people? He's like, are you smart enough to do well in whatever you're doing professionally and also help people at scale? Mm. And I feel that's a much more compelling na- narrative, right? Yeah. And that like really resonated with a lot of people with an HBS. Yeah. Where it's not like, are you good enough, but are you intelligent enough to try both? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of type A people in India would also kind of like relate to that, where like they pick up more collective responsibility, which is beyond their own personal trajectories. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I think um, that's also very, very interesting and some very cool learnings. Um, great. I think uh, we're now towards the end. The second last question, Neil, mm-hmm. is, uh, is actually one on you I think I'd love to just understand you come from a family of you know uh, academics uh, Mm -hmm. you had strong education yourself Mm -hmm. Uh, you've been in uh, high in high talent dense organizations Mm -hmm. if I if I had another word I'd probably come up with it but Zomato, Google you know HBS speak of that Um, what are personal values that perhaps you know let's say drive you as a human yeah uh, I've, I've already mentioned a lot of praise but i mean every word of it i think you're very calm composed kind helpful you should, all of you should that come home and meet my wife and tell her all this <laughs> she'll be so happy to hear this <laughs> but yeah. no but it shows i yeah. think uh, and the couple of introductions i made uh, to yeah. people of you as well they've all testified to it yeah. I, i'd love to just understand like considering all your experiences in life if you could just like define life philosophy for you, yeah. that helps you like lead day to day. Yeah. Uh, this is agnostic of, let's say, what's happening, right? So yeah, Google's yeah. happening, RHA is happening, you're leading all of this. Yeah, yeah. But like, what is the life philosophy like? Yeah. I mean, this is very philosophical in yeah, nature, yeah. but I'd love no, no. to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so that's a deep question. Um, we've talked about novel before this, and he often comes up with these gems of wisdom which is in the back of like your head but you never knew how to articulate it and then you hear yeah. it. Uh, so one thing which um, I try to kind of hold myself accountable to is taking the work we or I do very, very seriously mm. but really not trying to take my own self very seriously. And uh, obviously there are times that I fail at it but it's good to keep reminding no. One that I feel like, oh, you know, like, you remember in sports day in school when people are running on a relay yeah. and then anchored. If you look right or left to see who's coming up, you slow down. Yeah. If you just keep looking at focusing on your own track, you'll be fine. Yeah. So I feel like, like that's something I try to like take very very seriously, like my responsibilities and what I'm doing, but not myself. Like, mm-hmm. uh, so that's something which is core. Uh, I feel loyalty is something which has always mattered to me as a human, me as an individual. And that could be at any level, at a friendship, like, you know, relationship or a family or for that matter, a team. 
but like really having each other's back especially when the chips are down or uh, i think those are the things which matter in the bigger scheme of things those are the things you will remember not the successes yeah i think yeah again i'm trying not to take myself too seriously so i don't have too many other things to say <laughs> <laughs> you know? no, but this is this is again very helpful and yeah. interesting ones yeah, not I, to take yourself too and yeah, seriously i just i just saw uh, like while you were saying i just like remember one thing i yeah it's something which oh uh, we did a lot in zomato or we did a lot in the dobnod army with like the times when you when you're trying to solve for something you end up over intellectualizing both the problem is mm because assumptions would a b ho sakta hai this could also happen yeah. this is also a factor have we considered that the answers will always lie on the ground so i mm-hmm. feel like something i try to also do in my personal life is like just sometimes like think a bit but then get into doing yeah like all of like i should like think less and do more but i'm like still you have to think a bit yeah but most of the longer term answers will always lie on in the ground doing. Yeah. What are you doing? Think a bit, do more. Yeah. Yes, in yeah. your TEDx skit, we talk you. I was think yeah. less, do more. Yeah. Now I think of like seven years think down. I I'll uh, <laughs> think a bit and then do much more. I can imagine, but yeah. no, very very good point. Is honestly like I think a lot of food for thought. I think these are more practice than like you know hear and uh, understand the gravitas yeah. of. But uh, lovely to hear. Yeah. Um, for the last. What's question? yours? I'm I'm curious to you. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. For me, honestly, values-wise, I think uh, I'm just a huge believer in being uh, grateful. I often say I that, like that. Uh, to my people around as well that thank you and grateful are yeah. two words which if you practice more and more, yeah. I'm convinced are the yeah. most important in your dictionary. Yeah, yeah. And I think they just enforce a lot of uh, just being grateful. grateful for of where course. you are i of think course. it just brings a sense of contentment 100%. so i think that's a core value that i hold that's, that's awesome. um and the second thing my my superpower is also that i care i think um, i i this was a question somebody asked me once uh, in a dinner table conversation mm-hmm. and i sort of figured that if i really care about you i go all in and then yeah. i just care about it deeply yeah. the same is with my endeavors professionally as well right when i care about podcasting i just yeah. love it i yeah, yeah. care for it deeply right a- and that happens to be a superpower right. and that's a way to live life as well right. for me so i think these cool. two things i very interesting have you, have, have you read cialdini the Not. he's like a guru on sales i think novel also recommends okay. him charlie munger recommended like Ooh, wow. reading cialdini so one tra- trait of what he says is like some of the most successful sales people are the folks who can project like who genuinely like their customers yeah because you can't fake that mm-hmm. so if i'm selling you something it is better what i'm selling you if i can project like not project if i am fond of who you are as a person yeah. or the world or there's more abundance in my life then like i just like i have a better shot at yeah. that and uh i do think happiness is like two things one is like i've heard this once or twice i don't remember where but it's like contribution and an abundance mm. right like where contribution whatever you do in life whether it's like building an organization like contributing to a house looking after kids yeah. you should just feel like you're contributing in some capacity and abundance just means like knowing there's more there's enough in the world for everyone yeah so i think those two things are pretty important to yeah lead that life of content i agree yeah. yes so yeah those are mine um but but so glad for this conversation mm. the last one is a stereotypical question yeah, this yeah. is again standardized um but uh, let's uh, let's go back memory lane mm-hmm. um if you got a chance to you know talk to the yourself when you were taking the flight back from portugal to india yeah, yeah. you were conceptualizing rha yeah, alongside yeah. your uh co-founders friends uh, knowing all that you know now uh, about life about rha about the world what would you tell yourself and this by no means is by the way what you could change this is just to share that if you had the wisdom you have now on day 0 of rj yeah, yeah. what would that look like what is the power of that wisdom now no and this is a great square question i'll probably say like find people who are much smarter than you to build systems and make them robots awesome. right from day 0 mm-hmm. yeah. it's not about that, you it's about what you're building Yeah, that summarizes it. Yeah. That's been the core message you've been sharing all throughout as well. That systems will yeah. scale. Yeah, and great robins are the yeah. core of. Yeah, I wish I start doing that in day zero. Got it. Got it. Yeah. 
perfect. I yeah. think that's the best end I could have uh, possibly asked for. Thank you so much, Neil. You've Thank you for making it so kind. comfortable. Uh, yeah. I, I loved the conversation. We yeah. got so much of how to build an organization like Roman and Army. Uh, to look at it, as I said, has been very inspirational. Uh, the work that you all have done is collectively so powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and to get a behind the scenes of what it means to make it happen in practice yeah. um, has been an absolute delight. And I hope uh, this motivates more people to pursue initiatives like Robin Hood Army mm -hmm. and also contribute to the Robin Hood Army in some shape or form. Right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Look forward to what we can do together. Yes, yeah. very excited for that. Thank yeah. you.